Okay, so welcome back. This is going to be screencast number two for our unit on ecology. And just a couple of things to remind people about. In our very first screencast, I had mentioned that there would actually be two summative assessments over ecology. But because of time, what we're going to do is we're going to end up only doing one summative assessment on all six targets that are being addressed in this unit. And so this is going to be the second and final screencast for ecology. So what I'm doing here is I'm lumping 3, 3, 3, 4, and actually information from chapter 4, 4.2, into this one screencast. And so we're going to be looking at the cycles of matter. We're going to be looking at food webs, food chains, and the different types of cycles you might find in nature. We're going to look at niches. We're going to look at also community interactions. In other words, how do the different organisms in an environment actually relate and interact with each other? So when you're talking about ecosystems, it's really important for us to understand the flow of energy within that ecosystem. Now, there's lots of different ecosystems in the environment. And so each of those specific ecosystems is going to have a different variety of living organisms within that particular area. And of course, we can't forget that an ecosystem also includes the non-living aspects of that environment as well. Now in this case when you talk about the flow of energy we're primarily talking about either a food chain or a food web and both of them are actually pretty much the same thing. The only difference being is that a food web is much much more complicated than a food chain and over here on the right you can see the difference between the two. This one again extremely complicated this one up here pretty simple. Now a food chain is simply a series of steps in which organisms are going to transfer the energy that they have by eating and being eaten. So over here on the right you can see an example of the food chain of an owl. So if you notice we have the owl on the far right hand side and this is going to be one of our consumers. Now we have a mouse right next to it and if you notice that the arrow that is pointing from the mouse over to the owl indicates that the mouse is going to be eaten by the owl. Now the reason the arrow is going to point this way is because remember we are talking about energy flow. So all of the energy that we find in that mouse it's going to be utilized by the owl which means once the owl eats the mouse that's where the energy is going to be released and it's going to give the energy that that owl needs to be able to survive. So a really important part of food chains is making sure you understand why the arrow is pointing the way it does. Now down here as we had said with the food web, this is primarily just a network of feeding interactions. In other words, we have lots of different um, food chains that are kind of put together into one system. So again, we're talking about a specific ecosystem in most cases. And so if you notice, we still have the arrows being represented and the direction of the arrow is going to indicate the direction of energy flow. So again, for example, if you notice, the arrow is going to be pointing from the frog to the snake, and that's going to imply that the snake is going to eat the frog, and the energy from that frog is going to be passed on to the snake. In this case, if you notice the berries, the arrow is pointing to the um, green fly, so that means that all of the energy that you would find in those berries is going to be passed on to that green fly. Now, food chains and food webs, they do definitely demonstrate the idea of the flow of energy. But what we also need to think about here is we need to think about how much energy is actually being transferred to each of those different organisms as things are being eaten. And so what we do is we actually create something called an ecological pyramid. And to be more specific, we call it a pyramid of energy. And so what we do is we set something up based on the ecosystem that we're looking at. kind of looks like what you see right down here. And what we do is we give each of these different levels within the pyramid a special name, and we call it a trophic level. Now, if you notice, the words that we've used in the past, like producer and consumer, are being used here as well. Now, the producer is going to be all of those organisms in that particular ecosystem that can actually make their own food. And so down here, if you notice, we have this green material. Those would be the plants in that ecosystem. And that's where all of your energy is going to be stored in the very beginning. So if you notice, we have most of our energy. In this case, we're going to give it a number. We're going to say there's 1,000 kilocalories of energy stored in that plant material. Now, as these insects, which it looks like these are grasshoppers, as they come in and they actually consume those producers, we're going to pass up some of that energy. In other words, it's going to pass into that next trophic level. And typically, it's going to be approximately 10% is going to be passed on to that next trophic level. So 10% of um, 1,000 is going to be 100. 
So these insects right here are going to actually be able to take in about 100 kilocalories of the energy that was available in those plants. And we call them primary consumers because they are the very first level of consumers that feed on those producers. Now, continuing on, we look at the next trophic level. In this case, it looks like we have some rodents. They are going to feed on these insects and they are also going to take in approximately 10% of the energy that was found in those insects. And so we're going to bring the arrow up a bit. And so of that 100, we take 10% of that number, and that's going to give us 10 kilocalories that these animals are going to be able to take in. And at the very top of our pyramid, we have something called a tertiary consumer. And so same as before, we're going to pass about 10% of that energy up to that tertiary consumer which means 10% of 10 is going to be one kilocalorie, and that's about how much that particular owl is going to take in of the energy that's being found in those rodents. And so if you notice, the amount of energy that kind of moves up our pyramid is getting less and less and less. And so what some people wonder is, well, what happens to all of the rest of the energy that is actually found in that organism if only about 10% is being passed up each time? Well, the other 90% is actually being passed off as heat. And so a lot of the processes that occur in our body actually put off heat. And so a lot of the energy is going to be released in that way. Now, if we think about all of this energy, we need to think about how is the energy itself being recycled in the biosphere. So what we look at is we look at something called a biogeochemical cycle. In other words, this is actually isn't just one cycle. It's actually many cycles. So we think about elements actually passing from one organism to another and among parts of the biosphere through closed loops. And as I had said, those closed loops are called biogeochemical cycles. And again, this is going to be powered by that flow of energy that we were talking about in the previous screen. Now, as matter moves through these cycles, it's never going to be created and it's never going to be destroyed. It's simply going to be changed into a material that those organisms can use. Now, when you talk about biogeochemical cycles, they're actually going to be classified in four different ways. The first one is a biological process, and this means that any and all activities that are performed by any living organisms that are found on this planet. So if you notice over here on the right, we have a picture of cows, and we definitely have a picture of many trees. Well, the biological process being illustrated here is definitely the cows are going to be consuming um, various organic elements within its environment. And if you look over here on the right, we have trees which are probably photosynthesizing, and that is considered a biological process. Now, a second way that we would actually classify a biogeochemical cycle would be geologic. In other words, some of the cycles we're going to look at are actually going to include um, certain aspects of that cycle that might have volcanic eruptions, maybe the formation or breakdown of rock, maybe major movements of the earth, um, maybe above or below the surface. And over here on the right, you can see again a good example of a volcano that's um, basically putting out lava. And over here we have um, pretty large cracks in the earth, which would be representative of maybe an earthquake. Now the third way that we would classify a biogeochemical cycle is going to be the chemical and physical processes. In other words, the formation of clouds and precipitation, the flow of running water, and the action of lightning. And so over here on the right, of course, you can see a good example of water and the lightning being represented as well. And the fourth way to classify a biogeochemical cycle is going to be human activity. So any mining and burning of fossil fuels, clearing of land for building and farming, etc., might be used to, to um, actually make up part of that cycle we are discussing at that time. Now, one thing I did forget to mention is that if you look at the word itself, biogeochemical cycle, if you notice, basically we have three of these classification schemes already wrapped up in this word. So on your assessment, when you're asked to um, basically list the four different um, ways that we classify these cycles, you already have the answer which is in the word bio, which would be biology, geo, which would be geologic, and of course chemical would be chemical and physical processes. The only one you really need to remember is the fourth one, and that's the human activity, those things that we do that contribute to those cycles. Now, when we talk about those biogeochemical cycles, as I said, there's actually quite a few, um, but the only two that we're going to focus on is the water cycle and the carbon cycle. Now, the water cycle is probably one that you guys have looked at back in elementary school and I'm sure probably middle school, and it's a pretty simple cycle to, to understand. Obviously, we're talking about the ability of water to move throughout the biosphere.
And if you notice, of course, we have different areas that include the water. We have the oceans. We have water that's going to be found underground. We consider that groundwater. We have water that is considered a runoff. And so that would be the water that would come off of the mountains, for example. And so what we need to think about here is we need to think about how is that water actually making it to the different areas of the biosphere. Well, of course, when evaporation occurs, that water that is in a liquid form is going to change over into a water vapor or sort of a gaseous form. So then, of course, as that evaporation occurs, we're going to get something called condensation. And that's going to basically be the formation of the clouds that we see in the sky. And once that um, condensation gets to a certain point, that moisture is going to become really super heavy, and it's actually going to fall back to the ground as precipitation. And if you notice, precipitation can come in the form of rain, it could be in the form of sleet, and it can be in the form of snow. Now there's one aspect of this that we didn't talk about, and that is the idea of transpiration. Now, believe it or not, there are plants out there, in fact, most plants will actually transpire, which means it's kind of like sweating for us. In other words, these plants are going to sweat the moisture that they have in their structure, and they're going to release that moisture back into the environment. So in addition to evaporation, releasing that moisture back into the atmosphere, transpiration will do exactly the same thing. And that's why you see arrows coming from both of these areas. And then again, as we had said, once condensation occurs, once precipitation happens, it's going to find its way back down to the surface. And again, it's going to be um, basically absorbed by the soil. So it's going to become groundwater or it's simply going to run off and it's going to form our oceans, our streams, our rivers, our ponds, and our lakes. As I had said, the other types of cycles that we would look at would be things like um, the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the nitrogen cycle. These are all considered nutrient cycles. In other words, they have some part in basically the, the building of tissue in organisms and living organisms to be able to carry out life functions. Now, the only one that we're going to talk about is the carbon cycle. We're not going to mention the nitrogen or phosphorus cycle in this class. So as I had said, the carbon cycle is the only nutrient cycle that we're going to focus on. And if you notice in the upper left, they have simply color-coded the different aspects of that cycle and how they pertain to those classification schemes that we had looked at earlier on in the screencast. In other words, the biological, the human, the geological, and the physical or the chemical. So if you notice, if you look at biological, what we have right here is we basically have a cycle where we have CO2 being taken up um, by producers. Remember, the producers are the plants during photosynthesis, and it's going to be released by cell respiration. So that CO2 is going to be a big component to this cycle, and that's how this is going to occur from a biological standpoint. Now, when you look at a geological standpoint, what you're going to notice is that there's actually a lot of dissolved CO2 that you would find um, throughout the oceans and, of course, embedded within the land masses that are on this planet. A lot of these are going to be found in the marine sediments that are at the bottom of the ocean and maybe the carbon that's going to be found in rocks. And so, of course, when we have volcanoes that occur, those volcanoes will often release CO2 again back into the atmosphere. And remember, CO2 has a carbon component because you can see that C. Now, the physical and chemical, if you notice, we have this right through here. The carbon dioxide is going to dissolve in the rainwater, and it's going to eventually make its way back to the ocean. And, of course, um, through various means, again, the carbon in the marine sediments that you would find here, it's going to make its way back into the atmosphere as well. And, of course, we play our part in the carbon cycle also. So the burning of forests and fossil fuels is going to release CO2 as well. So the big thing here for this cycle is, how is CO2 being released and how is CO2 being absorbed within the environment? Now, the very last thing that we need to look at in regards to our unit on ecology is the idea of what a niche is and various community interactions that happen within our environment. So a niche is simply a range of physical and biological conditions in which a species is going to live and the way that that species is going to obtain what it needs to survive and eventually reproduce. So over here on the right, you're going to notice we have a good example of a niche. And so what I want you to do is I want you to focus only on is this oak tree. This oak tree actually has several different areas where you will find different niches for certain organisms. If you notice, we have the bees, we have the wasps, we have the moths, we have squirrels. Um, it looks like we also have various types of birds that are going to be inhabiting this area of the oak tree. Now, if you move a little bit further down around the trunk, you're going to have insects and insect larvae that are actually going to inhabit this part of the tree. And then if you look at the root systems, and they also call it the litter zone, you're going to have bacteria, earthworms, wood lice, and fungi 
that are going to find their way to this part of the tree. So what we think about here is we think about this oak tree as actually having several different areas where specific organisms can live. And so this part of the tree is going to basically supply the physical and the biological conditions necessary for these organisms. This part of the tree is going to supply, again, those biological and physical conditions necessary for these organisms. And then, of course, this part of the tree is going to supply those items for these organisms. Now, of course, thinking about all of these different organisms that you would find in these niches, there's definitely going to be quite a few community interactions that are going to be happening. Now remember, a community is basically made up of a lot of different species within a defined area. So basically what we're saying is we have quite a few populations in that area. And actually there's several different kinds of interactions that could be occurring. Competition is probably the most obvious one. It's when you have organisms that attempt to use the same essential resources like food, water, and living space in that same area. Anything that is considered extremely important to make sure that organism can survive is probably going to cause some sort of competition to occur. Predation, of course, is another type of interaction, and that's simply when you have one animal that's going to capture and feed on another animal. It's a pretty um, straightforward interaction. Now, herbivory is actually a form of interaction as well, but it's when you have one animal that's going to feed on producers. And remember, the producers are the plants. And so a good example of herbivory would be the deer that you might find in a forest because those deer are considered herbivores and they feed on plants. Now the fourth type of interaction is going to be symbiosis. And what I would like you to do is I'd like you to understand the difference between the three primary types of symbiosis. We have mutualism, we have commensalism, and we have parasitism. Now mutualism is just like the word implies. When you have two species that are going to interact with each other, but they're both going to benefit from whatever relationship has been established. You can see that we have an example of a bee and a flower. Now, of course, the bee is going to be gaining some sort of benefit in regards to the food that it might gather, the nectar it might gather from that flower, and the flower is going to benefit because it's going to probably be pollinated by um, the pollen that's being carried by that bee from another flower. So there's a, a mutualistic relationship between the two. They both benefit. Now, commensalism is a little bit different because one species is going to benefit, but the other is not going to be harmed, but it's also not going to be helped as well. And over here on the right, you can see these very, very tiny kind of um, crusty things that you would see on the top of this whale. These are barnacles. And these barnacles are going to benefit because they're considered filter feeders. So as that whale actually moves through its environment, it's going to be able to improve the ability of those barnacles to um, basically filter feed. It's going to bring water consistently over those barnacles so they can consume food. Now the whale, on the other hand, really doesn't benefit from this relationship because the barnacles doesn't provide anything to the whale. The whale is providing a benefit to the barnacles. Now parasitism is probably one that we're all familiar with. It's when one species actually will benefit, but the other one is going to be harmed in some way. And what you see over here is an example of a tapeworm that's found within the intestine of an organism. Now eventually, over a period of time, this tapeworm is going to get larger and larger and larger it might end up blocking the intestine, and of course that would end up causing harm to the organism itself. And there's a good chance that that organism might die. So that would be considered a parasitic type of relationship. All right, so I know I've thrown a lot of information at you at one time, but again, because we're on such a tight schedule, it's really important that you make sure that you get your screencast notes completed before you come to class.